I'm Matthew Bester. I'm an attorney at the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice. And with me today is Bernard M. Hollander, the senior trial attorney at the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice. Hi, Bernie. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, you began at the division in 1949. Can you uh, describe the first cases that you worked on? Well, I can't describe the first cases. I can tell you what they were because it's of interest. Um, the first one I remember was actually in the Supreme Court, and I got a little piece of, of uh, uh, legal research to do for Vic Kramer, my assistant chief. Uh, I can't even remember what it was, but I can tell you what the case was. It was the National Association of Real Estate Boards, which of course is also a defendant today, uh, for fixing commission rates. And there's another version of that today. Nothing changes. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about your uh, career and your educational experience before we go into your uh, long tenure at the Antitrust Division. Can you talk about your college and post graduate education and how that led to your interest in antitrust? Well, I went to Haverford College, a small college outside of Philadelphia, and uh, I majored in, in economics. And uh, I, the year I graduated, which was 1937, I didn't have any specific idea what I was going to do, and I ended up going for a year at the University of Chicago and taking courses all over the university. Uh, in the course of doing that, I, uh, I uh, took courses from a professor in the business school, among others, and he, he gave uh, two courses in the economics of imperfect competition. Uh, the undergraduate course used a, a textbook by John Chamberlain, I believe it was, of Harvard, on uh, the, that, that uh, subject. And then he had a graduate course, which was, had to be taken for a master's if you wanted that, um, uh, which involved uh, the same area but a, a more sophisticated approach did you end up getting a, an MBA at the University of Chicago? I did, but I hadn't intended to do that. It was sort of by accident. Um, there was, I should tell you a little sidelight, uh, there was a, a group on the campus that uh, handled a program that I was interested in, a radio program. Of course, there was no television then. And there was a sustaining program on NBC called the University of Chicago Roundtable which was probably the predecessor of many of these talk shows on Sunday. Anyway, three people would sit around this triangular table, and uh, not many, <coughs> not many uh, stations were taking this program. And so when, as the summer approached and I was uh, about to leave the university, or I thought I was going to, um, I had this idea that uh, we could maybe drum, drum up uh, interest on the part of the Chicago alumni in the various cities and markets which were not taking the program and put some pressure on the stations to, to accept the program. Um, the the uh, group on campus uh, that underwrote the program from General Motors, a Sloan Foundation, uh, thought well of this idea, but that they did ultimately didn't get the money, and the dean uh, Dean Spencer, William Spencer of the business school said to me, uh, you've taken my, my course uh, in social control of business. Now, mind you, this was when the, the uh, New Deal was fresh and uh, I wrote a paper for the dean on uh, the Communication Act and its effect on broadcasting. And uh, he said, why don't you, since this thing is falling through with a round table, why don't you stay for the summer and take the other three required courses uh, for a master's and I will try and get your, your uh, uh, residence in the university uh, accredited in the business school so that you could uh, qualify for a master's if you if pass your, your programs and you won't have to write another paper because you wrote one for me already. 
So and, you, you uh, took your MBA in uh, 1938, if I understand that? Yes, that's correct. I graduated from Haverford in June of 37 and went to Chicago starting in about September of 38. And then I was there until the end of the summer, the following summer, when I took these other uh, required courses. And I took an exam in social control of business, hard to believe for Chicago, uh, but they were quite different then. And so what did you do after you received your MBA at Chicago? Uh, I started looking for a job. And uh, I had a recommendation to the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, and uh, they were about, it turned out, to have some hearings on the the radio networks of the time. That was CBS, NBC had the red and blue network to them, and Mutual Broadcasting had one. Um, that was the extent of it. Of course, there was no television at the time. And so what did the hearings cover? The hearings covered the practices of networks, which the commission was, was in the process of developing uh, uh, in order to inform Congress uh, in case Congress thought there was any further litigation that was required, um, there would be a report at the end of these hearings. And uh, they, the long and short of it was, while I was not a lawyer, uh, the general counsel of the FCC thought that with my background um, in c communication and business that uh, I, could, uh, I could contribute something, something that attorneys and, and economists couldn't to the writing up of this report. So did you attend the hearings? Well, it turned out that I didn't know whether they were going to get the money and a waiver from the Civil Service Commission to hire me. Um, it turned out that they, they didn't, but by that time I had figured that I, if I was possibly going to write up the, help write up this report, I'd better go to the hearings, which were starting in September. So I started commuting from my family's home in Baltimore to Washington uh, during the, every week. And I would sit in the back of the, the hearing room. And uh, things interesting things grew out of that, that uh, development. Can you tell me about those interesting things? Well, there were two. The, when NBC was uh, giving its presentation, they were passing out exhibits. And they included two young people men who were sitting directly in front of me. I was in the back row. And I, uh, I leaned over the shoulder of one of them and said, do you mind if I look over your shoulder at the exhibit? And he said, of course not. Well, about a couple of weeks later, I got an introduction to the director of research at CBS. So when I went up to New York and walked into this man's office, he and I looked at each other, and, and we were the people that had been sharing this exhibit the week before, or several weeks before. Um, this was Frank Stanton, who then was uh, pretty fresh at CBS as director of research. Uh, he had taught at Ohio State, and uh, he had done some listening research. And so uh, CBS became interested in him, and he was at, at CBS in March of 39, uh, when finally he hired me after he appeared at the hearings. Uh, interestingly enough, when he, when he uh, testified, he came back when he got finished and said, how did I do? And I thought that was quite a good way to start off with a new boss. Did you stay at CBS until World War II? I did. I was there until December of 41. I uh, expected to be drafted, but then uh, I, the Navy got interested in, in uh, me as a possible uh, employee in s censorship, which Navy, the Navy thought they were going to have, and indeed did have, in censoring cables. Um, they had thought, since I was at CBS, I would have some background for that. Of course, it would, I had none, but I was, when the war broke, I was taking courses from the Navy in uh, cable censorship. And I was hired immediately in December of 41 uh, as a special agent under new, uh, Naval Intelligence, which at that time had responsibility for cable censorship. It later became an independent 
uh, operation in Washington under Elmer Davis. And so uh, what did you, could you describe your war service after that point? Um, well, after I was a special agent, uh, I, was, I was in line for a commission as an ensign, and uh, uh, when that happened shortly after I was commissioned as ensign, uh, uh, several of us who had some background in scientific uh, studies at, uh, at uh, college were sent to uh, first Chicago, uh, to Northwestern that is, uh, where there was a Navy indoctrination school. And uh, at that time, the American shipping on the East Coast was being demolished by German submarines. And the Navy had not foreseen uh, what was happening. And so the president ordered a, a uh, uh, priority program of building small ships, uh, subchasers so-called, uh, in order to give some protection to the convoys off the East Coast. And uh, because of that, uh, these, the class, our class of indo in indoctrination school was sent to Boston to a local defense school, and then we were sent to Miami in mass uh, because they needed reserve officers to operate these ships, and we didn't know anything about them. Did you uh, spend most of your time then in the Pacific theater of the war? We, yes, I got assigned to, to a subchaser at Miami, which was a practice, and we took it through the Panama Canal up the west coast to San Francisco because we were assigned to the western sea frontier. And after six months there, uh, I started as third officer on the ship. I moved to executive officer and then finally to commanding officer and uh, went out on uh, uh, as part of a, a anti-submarine screen for a bunch of LSTs, landing ships, uh, that were going to Hawaii. We were destined for the Hawaiian sea frontier, but because of the bad experience at uh, the Gilberts, they were looking for uh, sh ships that had shallow draft, and we only drew six or six and a half feet, and so uh, we were able to get over a lot of the reefs that the Previous uh, that at uh, Tarawa, the uh, control vessels for the head beachmaster were unable to get in close enough, and so we were selected to do that. And uh, I, I had transferred to, to my ship uh, the head beachmaster as we got to Kwajalein uh, in the Central Pacific and the Marshalls uh, for the invasion. And we were 2,000 yards off the beach dispatching the small boats to the beach. Did you uh, stay in the Navy through the end of the war? No. Uh, uh, I went, uh, after the Marshals and we talk and, and uh, Kwajalein, uh, we participated in the, in the invasions of, at Saipan, and then I was sent back uh, after 18 months on subchasers. <coughs> I was sent back to Miami for retraining ended up as navigator of a uh, assault cargo vessel and uh, was on that for the remainder of the war. And we participated in the occupation of, uh, of Okinawa. So you um, finished the war uh, and then went to law school after the war. Well, first I went back to CBS. I tried to get a job at the State Department in research and development because I was interested in public services, as I think I mentioned. Uh, but when, again, I was the low man on the totem pole, and, and uh, when they didn't get their appropriation, uh, I went back to CBS. And uh, I was there for a year. Uh, by this time, Frank Stanton was president of CBS, or vice president, I don't remember which, and he knew of my interest in public service, so he arranged that whenever there was a hearing at the FCC, either on FM licenses or, or in the most important case, uh, there was a hearing on CBS's application to, to broadcast in color. And so I was able to sit through those hearings and uh, what I learned there had a lot to do with what happened when I got to the, uh, to the antitrust division. Okay, so you um, 
uh, graduated from law school in 1949. Okay. June. And uh, that was 28 months after we started. Last accelerated course. And um, after that, you came to the antitrust division. Yes. And so, what sparked your interest in coming to the antitrust division? Well, uh, uh, first of all, one of the attorneys at one of the FM hearings said I should go to law school and put the the icing on the cake, as they put it, since the, it covered the experience I'd had. And when I came to the color hearings, I made the acquaintance of a reporter who recommended me later when I was looking for a job to Victor Kramer, who was a personal friend of hers. And uh, so I went and interviewed Victor and uh, uh, also, interestingly enough, the head of, then head of the judgment section, uh, Sig. Tim Berg and his his assistant Ed Pewitt. I remember those interviews well. And so, in the early 1950s, you were involved in a patent licensing investigation. Can you describe well, that, that? Yes, I can. Uh, this grew directly out of my experience at uh, at the color hearings. I I uh, gathered that RCA was opposing this this application by CBS because it involved patents that were not controlled by them. And up to that point, uh, they had controlled the, the standards, the patents on standards that were, uh, were adopted for broadcasting by, uh, by radio manufacturers, AM manufacturers, and then the FM manufacturers, and, uh, and uh, uh, finally, uh, the, the uh, Korean War intervened, and so while CBS had gotten permission to, to uh, broadcast in color, it really wasn't able to because of the war. Now, did you impanel a grand jury in this case? Well, I didn't impanel it. I, uh, I went to Victor and told him what I had learned at the color hearings and what RCA had seemed to be doing, and it seemed to have uh, to cover uh, the patent uh, atmosphere no matter where you looked in electronics. Uh, they had patents uh, uh, reading on all these standards. And so the, the pressure was on for anybody that, uh, that wanted to, to uh, introduce a new, a new type of uh, operation like FM or color. Uh, that they would have to have access to RCA's patents. And it turned out that, uh, that RCA had a p access to a pool. It had sublicensing rights to a pool of patents of some 12,000, I believe, uh, uh, patents that were the, the pooled patents of GE, Westinghouse, and AT&T, and RCA, and each of them had had, uh, had had license, exclusive licenses in the 1930s uh, to, to uh, use those patents in their own field of use to the exclusion of anybody else. Uh, but they had access to the whole pool, even though uh, in the case of RCA, they, they were limited to the uses for radio purposes. And GE and Westinghouse used them for power purposes, and the phone company AT&T used them for so-called public service communication, which meant telephone. Uh, uh, we, the department, actually had you had brought a case in 1930 uh, to break up this patent pool, and they had done it by uh, by accepting a consent from the the defendant RCA that. Uh, GE, Westinghouse, AT&T, and RCA would all uh, uh, relinquish their exclusive field of use. Well, nobody, nobody uh, realized in the intervening years between that and the 50s that even though they'd given up the exclusive use, uh, RCA had, uh, had non-exclusive use, and uh, the participants in this pool were still treating it by gentlemen's agreement as a uh, a division of fields, so which what, was illegal under the Sherman Act. What was the outcome of the case? The 1930 case, or the 52 the, the case. 52 case. 52, uh, I, I recommended with, with an economist, uh, High Rich, and recommended to Victor that we uh, 
have an investigation. And at that time, there were no CIDs, so this meant uh, in order to get testimony and documents, we had to impanel a grand jury. At the same time, unbeknownst to us, the New York office was recommending a case against RCA or an investigation of RCA. Uh, we subpoenaed documents from some 18 TV manufacturers, and uh, everybody complied in one way or another except RCA, who was resisting it. Uh, actually, they hit us one afternoon with a, a, uh, a show cause order that John Cahill, the former, uh, former Southern District uh, U.S. attorney, had gotten from one of the judges, uh, required us in five days to respond why the subpoena shouldn't be quashed because, according to Cahill, uh, RCA was suffering every day in its patent licensing losses because of this uh, pending grand jury. So did the Attorney General eventually become involved in this? The, the, attorney, the attorney General, when we brought the case, became involved, uh, excuse me, uh, did not become involved, but the, uh, uh, the subsequent Attorney General and the, and the last Attorney General in the, in the Truman uh, administration, uh, Judge, uh, Judge McGranary, um, became quite interested, and of course we didn't know why, but the speculation was RCA was putting pressure on the department to give up this, this uh, grand jury, and uh, since the judge, Judge Weinfeld, had refused to quash the grand jury subpoena, uh, they were trying to get a, the Attorney General to give up our, our uh, grand jury authority. So did Judge McGranary call for a meeting with you? Judge McGranary uh, re uh, called us and, and uh, insisted that we give him a report before the end of the administration on RCA's compliance. And of course, they dumped a bunch of documents on us, and we had to have a task force, really, to go through this. A whole bunch of us went to New York and uh, come back and report to him before the administration changed. So on the last day of the administration, which, as I remember, it was a Saturday, uh, we went up uh, to, the, to the Attorney General's office. By this time, the, attorney, the Assistant Attorney General, uh, who was uh, Hugh Morrison, had been fired, uh, 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 reportedly in the, in the Washington merry-go-round, uh, because he refused to give up the RCA authority, and so obviously pressure was being put on uh, to get rid of this grand jury. Anyway, we went up to the attorney general, and he said, "Well, he was pretty well decided that he was going to give up this grand jury authority. He was assured by RCA's principles that." Uh, we would get complete compliance uh, by uh, proceeding civilly, and they just wanted to get rid of the grand jury, and he was inclined to go along with it. Uh, we gave him a number of reasons. The main reason was not to do it, was that uh, uh, we would not have the same kind of authority to compel production and compel testimony that we, that we had when we had a grand jury. Uh, it so happened that uh, there was a, a, a similar grand jury investigating the oil cartel at that stage in Washington, and that judge was in, important by the defense counsel, as many of whom were the same as ours, uh, to give up grand jury authority. And uh, uh, we were resisting it, as I said. Um, while we were in that office, the phone rang, and it became quickly apparent, apparent that uh, it was the president calling the attorney general. And it was also apparent, from what the attorney general's end of the line was, that he was giving the same reasons not to give up the oil cartel that we had given him as to why we had to keep the grand jury authority in RCA, which was quite a thing. So anyway, uh, so he, the outcome of the case uh, was uh, with RCA. What was the outcome of the case? Well, the outcome was that uh, he gave up the grand jury, and uh, we tried to proceed criminal uh, civilly, and uh, we were not getting satisfaction 
And in the meantime, the new administration put in Judge Stanley Barnes, a Superior Court judge from Los Angeles, as head of the uh, head of the antitrust division, and Judge Barnes was was uh, uh, interested in in what was going on because I know this because I got a phone call from his secretary saying you know you're the only one down here that knows anything about this grand jury, aren't you? And I said yes. Yeah. So he said, well, Judge Barnes has been approached by a, a football player that played with him at Cal, uh, who's a patent attorney for RCA and wants to bring a bunch of people from RCA in. And the judge was upset because he had never heard from this man, and also he didn't know, uh, he didn't know what, who was coming or what was going on. Yeah. Anyway, he called me in. I briefed him on, on our uh, complaints and... Uh, showed him a letter we'd sent to the general account, uh, atten- attorney for RCA, Bob Werner, demanding that they, that they come through with their, uh, with their uh, offer to give us all the documents we needed and would have gotten from the grand jury. So uh, maybe you could just describe more generally um, you know, the level of uh, the number of people you had on your staff um, during those investigations and maybe compare that to what you experience today? Well, well, we had uh, four or five attorneys in New York, including me, because I was up there every week, um, and that that was about the size of it. Uh, we had one economist, uh, High Rich, who I mentioned before. What was the procedure for getting investigations started when you were uh, at the division at this time? Well, normally you would you would. Uh, try to persuade your section chief with a fact memorandum and proposed complaint if it was a civil case or if it was going to be look like it could be both civil and criminal and we often brought civil and criminal cases at that time. Um, what was the reason that you brought both civil and criminal cases? Well the reason was that the criminal case was to punish for the violation of the law at, that it occurred, and the civil case was to get an, uh, get injunctive relief or or substantive relief, uh, structural relief, uh, that we could enforce uh, with a with a decree uh, at, by contempt action, um, and and so the frequent it was frequently done. It was not uh, not not unusual at all to to. Uh, to file both. Now, in the 1960s, there were um, a few prominent cases you were involved in. Um, one was a case involving the Los Angeles Times. Can you briefly describe that? Yes. Uh, uh, briefly, the Los Angeles Times was the largest morning and Sunday paper in, in uh, Southern California. It acquired the San Bernardino Sun, which was a monopoly paper in San Bernardino County. And it, this was the, one of the first uh, cases brought involving da- daily newspapers with the Clayton Act. Uh, we charge violation as Clayton and Sherman Act. But I think you want me to mention, and I've forgotten perhaps, the, uh, ca- the uh, case in Philadelphia that we brought uh, involving a, a station swap between Westinghouse Broadcasting and NBC, which Westinghouse uh, charged was was coerced, um, and uh, the long and short of it was, we we uh, required NBC to get out of Philadelphia, give up the Philadelphia station they had acquired, and uh, uh, get another station. Uh, the FCC changed personnel that by then, and uh, by the time they got the light to licensing. Uh, relicensing RCA, which was applying for, I think, San Francisco, the the uh, anti, the uh, uh, FCC said, "Well, we didn't know there was an antitrust violation here. We think that uh, you should go back to Cleveland, which is where the station had been before. Uh, the Westinghouse had had to take with a three million dollar boot for the difference in markets." You've described this case as involving a bathtub conspiracy. Can you talk about what a bathtub conspiracy is? Well, we charged both RCA and NBC as defendants because each of them had a had a uh, uh, reason for doing for 
uh, enforcing this, uh, this swap of stations. And uh, it also, this case is important because it went to directly to the Supreme Court under the Expediting Act, and whereas we had been thrown out in Philadelphia of our, uh, on our initial complaint, we w were very shortly in the Supreme Court, which unanimously reversed the district court, and then RCA settled. I didn't mention that. We had a consent decree with them, which required them to get out of Philadelphia. Uh, I'd like to talk about a couple of cases you were involved in in American Samoa. Can you talk about uh, first the Civil Aeronautics Board air route case? Yes. Um, I got a call from a, uh, an acquaintance of mine at the CAB who was in charge of routes, and he said, asked me would I be interested in, in representing another department at uh, on loan or something of the sort, uh, uh, because he said there was going to be a trans-Pacific investigation of both of all the fly, all the routes in the in the Pacific, uh, looking to getting a, a co competitive carriers in on the various routes uh, to compete with Pan Am, because up to that point, <clears throat> we had nobody in the Atlantic or the Pacific under the chosen instrument theory policy, uh, but Pan Am. What's the chosen instrument policy? Well, it merely meant what it says, that the one, one uh, uh, carrier was chosen as the instrument of the United States in both the Atlantic and the Pacific, and so there was no competition, uh, not just in American Samoa, but in, uh, for the routes to New Zealand and Australia, and the routes to China and so forth, the whole Pacific, as well as the Atlantic. And so what was the outcome of the investigation? The, outline, uh, the uh, uh, trial examiner found that there should be competition, uh, competing airline, continental, um, to, uh, to Australia and New Zealand, which is what they really wanted, and that uh, Samoa would be served on the way, as well as, of course, Fiji and Tahiti, which were already served by Pan Am. And what, so let's move on and talk about the second case that you handled in Samoa, um, the oil storage terminal case. Can you talk about that? Yes. When, when I went down to Samoa to interview witnesses before the uh, Trans-Pacific hearing, which was going to be very shortly after the governor had, had uh, taken me on as an assistant Secret, uh, assistant uh, to him. Um, uh, the governor mentioned to me that he had a, a, a problem that he thought was an antitrust problem, and it was that Standard Oil of California controlled the, the entire market of American Samoa, which wasn't that big, but it was the whole market, um, by controlling uh, through a so-called lease that they had gotten, which would run for 50 years at the option of Standard Oil and gave the government no right to cancel. The government owned the storage facilities that anybody who wanted to, to serve American Samoa had to use. So that gave them a lock on the market, and we were trying to get a competitor in there. And so what was the section of the Sherman Act that you filed this case under? We filed it under the uh, section that covers territories and, and possessions of the United States, Section 3, which of course also covers the District of Columbia and, and any other, Hawaii, uh, at that time, Hawaii and, and uh, the Virgin Islands and Alaska, all of which were territories. And uh, you've talked about a taxi ride that you had during that case. Could you talk about that and its significance for the case? Yes. Uh, we were we were at the end of our uh, direct case in which uh, and I put on basically two witnesses, uh, one Governor Lee who was a, had been the Democratic governor, and then the second Governor John Hayden who was a Republican and was then the governor, both of whom testified as to the uh, harm that was being done to the economy of American Samoa by ha having only. Uh, a single monopolist as their uh, supplier. We wanted to get uh, uh, break open the market by uh, 
uh, requiring Standard Oil, instead of having a, an exclusive on the, the storage facilities, to share them with anybody who wanted to come in on a shared cost basis. Can you talk about the taxi ride that you had during that case and how it helped you? We got into a cab late one night, the, the night when we had finished our presentation, and <clears throat> the, some, the uh, taxi driver looked Polynesian to me, and I asked him whether uh, he was Samoan by any chance, and he said yes. And where was the hearing, first of all? I should have oh, the hearing that. was in San Francisco, and okay. this was late at night, and we were on our way back to the hotel. And uh, uh, I said, well, you should have been in court. We had two governors of American Samoa. He said, who were they? I said, uh, Governor Hayden and Governor uh, uh, Lee. And he said, and I, then I said, well, another governor is going to testify for Standard uh, starting on Monday, so you could come to that. And he said, who is that? I said, Peter Coleman. He said, that crook? And I, I said, well, you know, why do you say that? And he proceeded to tell me all the things that, uh, that had been done by Peter Coleman and his brother uh, to the detriment of the, uh, the territory. And Coleman had been a governor at the time when Standard Oil got its lease. It wasn't surprising that we ended up with a conspiracy between the government of American Samoa, Attorney General, and the governor and Standard Oil. And so did you use the material from the taxi driver in your cross-examination? Well, when, when Peter Coleman went on the stand for Standard, you can be sure I brought out everything that had been told about how his brother owned, owned uh, Air Samoa and they owed, owed money to the government still for fuel at the airport. So what was the outcome of the case? The outcome of the case was that the judge found that, uh, in fact, we were correct. There was a violation, and uh, he he accepted our our proposed relief, which, as I mentioned, was sharing the uh, sharing the facilities and, on a shared cost basis. In addition to which, he canceled Pan Am's requirements contracts and the the uh, uh, canneries, which were the main industry who had requirements contracts, also with Standard Oil. Uh, he. Let's talk a little bit about um, the role of expert witnesses in antitrust cases. How has the role of expert witnesses changed over your tenure at the division? Well, it hasn't changed for me, but it's changed as a uh, practice. We get all kinds of economic experts testifying. For example, in Los Angeles Times case, we had four or five expert economists on their side saying well, why the two papers weren't in uh, competition, and we had our witnesses who were industry people who testified, pr uh, publishers who testified as to the difficulties they had with, with the situation. Um, and in the 1970s, then, you uh, handled some uh, network cases. Can you describe what these network cases were? Well, the network cases had been recommended long, long ago in, in the 60s, but the FCC conducted a preliminary inquiry and they called, uh, developed a very thorough re uh, uh, record, and so our case was put on hold. Uh, but when um, McLaren came in as, uh, Dick McLaren came in as a, uh, Assistant Attorney General, he was very favorable to bringing cases against all three. We didn't want to charge conspiracy among the three, but we, we charged each one of them with violations of Section 1 and Section 7. And what was the issue uh, there? Excuse me, Section 1 and Section 2. What, what was the issue there? The issue was that the, the networks uh, did what, what uh, the Paramount uh, decrees had prevented the movie studios from doing, namely, using their, their uh, exhibition operation to augment a conspiracy. Now, we didn't charge conspiracy, but uh, the, the gist of the problem was that the networks controlled uh, uh, access to their broadcast uh, networks, which were uh, had to be used in those days for advertising. And uh, um, 
they exacted from any independent producer uh, 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 profit shares in all uses of the, of the program, if, if they even looked at it, and also syndication rights. And in addition to that, the FCC had, it, had in effect put out rules that enjoined those things, but they had not uh, closed the door on the network's uh, uh, creating 100% of their entertainment programs at night, which was the meat of the profits, uh, in-house, if, if in fact the FCC rules went into effect. So, and what was the outcome of that case? Well, the outcome was um, after uh, we were accused of bringing the cases for an improper motive because uh, by the time we got into litigation, the, the, uh, the networks had discovered that that uh, pressure was brought on them. Well, they knew pressure was brought on them by uh, by the administration, and they said that this was an improper use and that that uh, fouled the the cases and they were couldn't be uh, pursued. The judge, uh, the judge, uh, they also charged uh, primary jurisdiction by the FCC, but of course that had been settled by the RCA NBC case I mentioned before. Uh, so that that didn't cause any problem. But anyway, the judge refused to dismiss us with prejudice and we filed the cases a second time and they tried to, to raise the same affirmative defense. And so the cases were settled by consent decree? Well, NBC, after the judge refused uh, to accept the affirmative defenses uh, and dismisses, uh, NBC decided to settle. and. Uh, CBS and ABC uh, uh, kept going at a furious pace on uh, depositions of the movie studios and so forth, but uh, we, we finally uh, settled with CBS and ABC. So let's wrap up with a few kind of general questions. Um, tell me, how has prosecuting antitrust cases changed over the course of your career? Well, among other things, it, the size of the staffs has changed drastically. Uh, when when uh, we brought the Philadelphia swap case, uh, there was myself and Ray Carlson, uh, and that was it. We handled the grand jury investigation which preceded the case, and we handled the case itself. What types of matters are you working on now at the division? Uh, mostly back to newspapers, which is interesting to me after that time uh, uh, away from them. Times Mirror. And you've done two other oral histories um, recently. Can you just, in a word or two, describe those? I did one for the Navy uh, covering my 18 months on, on uh, wooden subchasers in the Pacific. Uh, I've done a, a one now for myself, on the, uh, which is about 200 pages, on the 58 years I've spent in the antitrust division. And what's your role at the division today? Well, I'm sort of like of counsel. I, I'm sort of a utility infielder. I, I operate wherever I'm needed and I try and give help. And I'm also an institutional memory because I remember things that the computers don't. Well, Bernie, we're going to end it on that note. Thank you very much for talking today. Thank you.